Many of you have probably been to, uh, or may have been to, the Yorkdale Food Court before it was changed. Uh, do you recall that place? It was upstairs and had this incredible dome in the food court. It was incredible in that if you sat on in a seat on one side of that dome, on the other side of the dome, which is probably at least as far as the back wall here in the, in the hall, you could hear whoever was sitting over there talking as clear as if they were at your table. The sound just echoed off that perfect dome in a way that brought it to you and you had to be very careful whatever you said when you were in that part of the food court. Toronto author Kenneth Opal, I'm pretty sure, spent some time in that food court before he wrote the books known uh, as his Silverwing series, stories about bats and their different, uh, the different realities that happen to them. It's a, they're a suspense, uh, thriller, um, mystery stories uh, written for young adults, young, young kids, I guess, maybe 12 to 14. Because in that series, in the original tree that the bats uh, had their colony in, at the base of that tree had been created for the history of the bats to be told, a perfectly circular space. And every year, a single bat would be given the responsibility to go into that space and tell the story of that year, what had happened to the bat colony, to the individual bats within it, the challenges, the opportunities, the things that had happened, and put it into that perfectly circular space. Each bat who told the tale, of course, had a different wavelength in their telling. And so as they told that story, it would begin echoing in that perfectly round chamber down through eternity, that particular voice telling about that particular year. And so anyone, any bat going into that circle, into that orb-like space, could tune their ear to a particular voice and hear what happened on that year. It was like the greatest libraries we have ever known in bat form in that perfect circle. Our attempts to capture what has gone before us, our histories. Those are some of the great endeavors of humankind, of our human history itself, is this attempt to capture what has gone before so that we might extrapolate some expectation into the future, so that we can make sense of how we got where we are. Our understandings of history and how it's collected and how it's told and its purpose and how it can be used are very new. They aren't, we haven't looked at history the same way down through our time. Herodotus, back in the 5th century BC, was probably the first person to actually write down history, trying to glean from the accounts that he heard when he was traveling, the difference between what was reliable and what was really a little less reliable, and trying to establish something that really reflected what had gone on. In his stories, he accounted for much of what went on through a divinely guided understanding of the universe and how the world was going to unfold and wove into some of his history that telling. Although the attempts to tell history without any kind of supernatural uh, intervention uh, were in existence about 100 years after he started writing, uh, it didn't become prevalent until much later in Western thought. And much of that is because our telling of history has always been from the perspective that it's the living out of a history of a divine being and that we are either plotting our way along a path that has been set out before us or we're picking up pieces of what has been done before and explaining uh, where we are based on that history that has gone before. In 1961, a book by E.H. Carr was written that looked at history and suggested that maybe as historians told the story, they themselves were pulling little bits and pieces out and privileging them over others. 
and that the stories and the dates and the characters that they pulled out, whether they were related to the social uh, unfolding of a, of a culture or whether they were specific political or military uh, dates and individuals, that they were creating history and, and forming it themselves because they were picking out just little bits and pieces. The story that he most identified was the crossing of the Rubicon, which had been done by thousands of people, but only one is ever remembered for it, because a historian picked that up and wrote about it. And so uh, Carr challenged us to think about history in a way that even up until 1960, we really hadn't looked at seriously. When we went to school, most of us took history and it was remembering what? Military conquests and the discoveries of this and that by peoples that were taking over from another group. I read a history online uh, not that long ago of uh, European history from an indigenous North American's point of view. It was a short history, about a paragraph which is sometimes all we, when we were growing up, got about Indigenous history, except uh, as it existed in relation to those who discovered North America. Our understanding of history continues to evolve. The movie 12 Years a Slave is based on the book 12 Years a Slave. And there are, uh, in the reviews and in the reflections on the power of this movie, there are those who are saying that it will be, uh, going forward, one of the most significant historical accounts of slavery in the United States. That the way it has been told and what it offers us is a clearer view than we have ever had before. Gone with the Wind is touted as one of the ones from the past that had a significant uh, reflection on what slavery was like, though I can't imagine it was particularly accurate. But of the histories that come forward and that find their way into film, and there are not that many, undoubtedly because for America, the story of slavery is not a pretty story. And so... It hasn't actually, even in the 1960s when, uh, you know, it was all peace, love, and let's be honest with ourselves, movies about slavery were not prevalent. And so this story, based as it is on a book that was actually published in 1853, a best-selling book about the realities of slavery, is seen to be an accurate portrayal of what happened at that time. But we have to ask ourselves, is it? Or is it, as Carr has noted, the picking up of one or two little pieces and putting them together for us to see a tale, to have an effect, to come to an understanding? I don't mind the fictionalizing of history if it helps me understand something better. The uh, book called Five Smooth Stones, who I can't remember who wrote it, of course. Uh, Five Smooth Stones, a story written about, uh, in the 1960s about the experience of blacks during that time affected me profoundly and helped me understand the concept of racism in a way that I wouldn't possibly, couldn't possibly have without having read that story. And it has its critics as well. But the empathy that uh, I was able to find within myself in response to racism, the recognition of my own prejudice itself, woven because of my reading of that book has had a profound effect on me. And so this movie and the book that it was based on also have a profound effect. Now Northup didn't actually write the book. It was uh, written with the assistance of another man, a white man, who helped him get his experience of being in slavery out on paper, helped him articulate what it was like to have been a, a free man, a second generation free man, uh, kidnapped and thrown into slavery in the conditions that are appalling. And as I watched the movie with Scott, I, I kept leaning over to him saying, well, it was actually worse than that in the book. It was actually worse than that in the book. The, his original beating that took place in Washington before he was put on the ship to take to the South was much more graphic in the book than it was in the movie. And the whipping of Patsy, uh, tied to the post in the movie, is far more graphic and horrific in the book, splayed as she is and tied to four pegs on the ground, face down and whipped. In the book, it seemed to be horrifically offensive, yet it seemed, and I couldn't understand, uh, why it would have been 
muted in the movie. The scene where Northup is uh, tied to the tree isn't quite the same in the book either. He's forced to stand bound in the hot sun for the whole day, which would have had much the same effect as what was portrayed in the movie, but he wasn't actually, the rope wasn't actually up over the branch in his telling of it. It makes us question uh, what McQueen has brought to the story and what he's asking us to remember going forward and whether those details make any sense at all. But if we go back to the book and we ask, what of those details too? Which of them are lifted up and held out, particularly for us to listen to, for us to write our histories with? How free was a black person in the northern United States in the 1940s when Northrop was first kidnapped. How extensive was that kidnapping process and how indignant were the politicians and the leaders when they found out it had happened when indeed uh, history suggests and scholarly articles suggest that it happened way more than just one man who happened to get free and write a book about it. Mostly it was the turning of heads so that you didn't see, so that you didn't actually notice what was going on. And how likely is it uh, that McQueen posits that Northup comes back to the same townhouse that he left 12 years before, left a wife and three children alone. How likely was it that they could exist in that townhouse to the end and be there to welcome him in the perfect Hollywood ending at the end of the film? The documents that she actually filed when she was trying to get Northup back uh, indicate that she was living in poverty and needed support uh, from the state to be able to get him back to her. And Northup himself actually disappeared a few years later. He became an abolitionist uh, traveling around the country, sharing his story so that others might learn of what had happened and might become part of that underground railway and the ways that people could get free from that kind of slavery. His attempts to have those who had kidnapped him brought to justice uh, failed ultimately because he disappeared. And so there were rumors always that he had been re-kidnapped, that he had been sent once again uh, to the south, that he was again in chains. Others suggested that he had just fallen into drink and had, not, had lost contact with his family and not made anything of himself in the end. And any pieces of the story that anyone has been able to pick up are inconsequential. But one of the things that I think McQueen was trying to bring to our attention was the concept of silence. Silence as it relates to history. Silence as it relates to how we look at our history and how we create our everyday and how we posit what the future might be. Early, early in the movie, Solomon is standing in the, in the store purchasing a rucksack for his wife to take to her job that she has annually at another hotel, cooking a meal. And a southerner with a slave is in town, and the slave makes his way into the shop. His master gets upset with him and comes in and forces him to leave before any words have really been exchanged. But of that, of the fact that this was a black person enslaved in their in their town, nothing is said. During the time that Solomon is in slavery, he finds it best not to say anything about who he is. His initial attempts at that, uh, he was brutalized for trying to insist that he was a free man. And so he remains completely silent through the entire event about who he really is. In the movie, it suggests that he tries to tell Ford who he is, and begs that Ford acknowledge, uh, which he refuses to do. McQueen, again, reinforcing that concept of silence. If there's nothing you can do about it, remain silent for God's sake. That didn't come out in the book, but in the movie, I think McQueen is picking it up as a theme. And then at the end, when he's rescued as Platt from the field and offered back his life as Solomon Northup, and Patsy embraces him as she does in the book and weeps and cries as he goes away. Northup has to fall again into a kind of silence. Speaking about his experience and sharing who 
the people that he worked with all those years were, sharing their history as wide as he could, but silence around him in terms of what might actually be done, and ultimately a silence that left the story in the historical record for so long until being lifted again. Perhaps one of the most powerful things that could be said about 12 years a slave wasn't actually said about 12 years a slave. It was said about the book Man Gone Down by Michael Thomas, a book published in 2007, one of the New York Times top 10 books of that year. I think it's a first novel by Thomas who's exploring the reality of a man from the first person, an unnamed man in the story, who was, as he calls it, a social experiment, a black man being bussed into the white schools so that he might get the privilege of a white education, of the horrors and challenges that affected his growing up and how from the very beginning he sees himself as a man going down. And one of the reviewers of the book, Kayamo Glover, a woman who has an incredible uh, pedigree of academic background for a black woman going back three generations, says, more than anything else, he knows how little, but also, fortunately, how much it can take to bring a man down. The protagonist in Thomas's novel makes his way step by ugly step over the course of a very short period of time uh, from disillusionment and discouragement to despair. But it recognizes through all of that, it's the telling of how even the smallest little things can also bring his spirit up in the, in the face of that. And so too, McQueen and Wil Wilson, who helped Northup write his book, place within it these things that could bring the man up even in the process of going down. And so I think Glover's remark that how much it takes to put a man down is a significant part about this movie and the silence that McQueen weaves in and throughout it. Just in terms of the historical details, Dana, if you can show me that, oh, well, that's the... That's obviously Solomon. This is the home that is shown on the movie, uh, in the movie. This is the home of Edwin Epps, uh, the plantation owner who is ignorant and cruel uh, throughout the whole of the time that he has Solomon Platt as a slave, uh, horrific to his other slaves, particularly Patsy, uh, who won the, the jealousy and the hatred of Epps' wife. We recognize the plantation built by slaves and we, and we have this sense of uh, superiority because we don't want that kind of excess. Certainly not if it's built on the back of slaves. But Epps House actually continues to exist on the grounds of Louisiana State University. And if you can show me the next slide. This is what it looks like which is much more like what the slaves' uh, houses looked like, their residences looked like in the movie than what it actually was. And I think McQueen, rather than showing us that Epps you know, was struggling too, trying to make it on that bio like everyone else, he wanted to place a distance so that we, it, it, made, us e it made it easier for us to judge, to, to separate ourselves from the realities that were going down. But I want to lift out of the movie and out of Northup's book, which is a phenomenal read, you can find it online, uh, a page turner, as they say, uh, and it can give you a little more insight, although you need to bring to it a critical assessment in the same way that you have to to the movie. Anne wouldn't have stayed in that townhouse his family wouldn't have been all together. What happened when he went home, we will never know. But if you go to the next slide, I want us to apply some of the concepts of resilience. This is what I think Glover is getting at when she talks about the protagonist and man gone down. The resilience in the human heart, the resilience in the human f faculties that allow us to get beyond such horrific trauma. Resilience is not an extraordinary thing. 
Studies have shown that it's a very human thing, that ordinary as we are, we find our way to resilience through a, a thousand, thousand things through our lives. Certainly not as traumatic as having the skin whipped off our backs on a regular basis. But the reality that things don't go the way we want them to go, that sometimes we have no voice, that we cannot speak out for what is right, that those around us make decisions about our fate that we have no control over, whether they're lodged within systems that we function within in our lives, or whether they live in the same house that we're in, or whether as we age, there are children making choices about where we're going to live, removing from us our autonomy so that we might be better cared for. We find these moments where the, our lives turn upside down and we have to cope with them in some way and the human spirit has the ability to do that. And so, as you see, in these points about resilience, Northup shows almost everyone throughout the movie and throughout the writing of his book the capacity to make realistic plans and take steps to carry them out. Even in captivity, he, he struggles with trying to find what he's always convinced that he will find his way out, that he will find his way out of slavery and back home to his family. When one of his very carefully plotted out plans comes to an end, a piece of paper that he's been writing a letter on, he burns it and you watch the last embers fade away in a fairly long sequence in the movie, reflecting how at that moment his hope dissipated and disappeared. But in actual fact, as soon as another opportunity in the form of the carpenter Bass raised itself and he overheard Bass talking to his master, to Epps, he realized another opportunity was there and the embers weren't gone. He always had within him this, this idea that it shouldn't be like this and I can do something about it. And so he sat about immediately to make more plans and they carefully, carefully plotted their way toward the success of those plans, dependent as they were upon people that Northam would never be able to contact himself, dependent as they were on the life of a single man with a voice who was willing to use it for Northup. A positive view of yourself and confidence in your strengths and abilities. Throughout the book, it's interesting to see that Northup lifts up uh, the whole process of cotton growing, the process of sugarcane and harvesting sugarcane, and he writes in very detailed passages exactly how it was planted, how it was harvested, what the slaves did, what the overseers did, in very, very careful detail reflecting every time on his own skills and abilities, his abilities as a musician. In the book, he creates this fish trap because they never had enough food. But once he created a fish trap, he was able to give fish to all the people that he worked with. And he talks about his own skills and abilities and shares them. He knows he has abilities that others don't. They, the fact that he does, that he recognizes that, that he gives himself uh, the accounting of that is a significant part of resilience. Skills in communications and problem, problem solving, which show up, of course, not just because he's, uh, he's intelligent, but I think too because he grew up as a free man and so he can read and he can write and he's articulate, though he does not let his masters know that. He, he, he takes pride in his skills and he offers them wherever he possibly can and the capacity to manage strong feelings and impulses. Platt, the slave, loses it on more than one occasion. Perhaps because he hasn't grown up as uh, he and the, three, uh, and the other free men who were on the ship heading south uh, recognized. He, he hadn't grown up with the attitude of those who had been enslaved all their lives. And so on occasion, he takes into his hands the responsibility for allaying the violence against himself uh, to very tragic and challenging circumstances on each occasion. But he does, for the most part, try to maintain control of his emotions. He recognizes where he is and what he can do. And so he's able to manage those moments of horrible difficulty most of the time. Beyond these, uh, 
studies show, and the American Psychological Association has on its website, a whole brochure of several pages of how we can make resilient lives, how we can strengthen ourselves for those moments in our lives when things go awry. Not in the moment. In the moment, it's probably a little late. But even in the moment, you can make decisions that can help you cope. Things like making connections with other people, acceptance that change is a part of living, that not everything will be stable all of your life, that there are goals, even when you've lost the goals that you have as Northrop had, uh, there are other goals that can be put in place, even if they're goals that will only be achieved in the next hour or couple of hours, even if they're not as grand and as huge as you may have imagined. You can set a goal and you can accomplish it and feel the sense of that accomplishment. You can take decisive actions and look for opportunities to learn about yourself, your situation, so that you can move in it differently with more confidence, uh, understanding the parameters, what, what will work and what won't, and knowing within those limitations how best to act. To keep things in perspective, to maintain a hopeful outlook, to take care of yourself, and yeah, that means exercising regularly, I know. Additional ways of strengthening resilience are helpful in any situation. And we, though we know that it's an ordinary part of human experience, don't necessarily build it to our advantage. When we have our sharing time, and I talk about weaving ourselves into community by sharing what it is that is going well for us and sharing what it is that challenges us and burdens our hearts, we are building our capacity for resilience. We are holding ourselves together and strengthening ourselves, not just as the community that I speak so much of, but as individuals who can articulate when things are wrong, when there is a justice that our hearts yearn for, when things are bad and there is a hoped for outcome that we still seek to find our way toward, when things go well and we can celebrate and assuage some of our losses, some of our pain. We are building resilience. And resilience is one of those important parts of life that normal and natural though it may be, when those moments that we must call upon it come to us, our capacity for it, have we been intentional about it, will be broader and deeper and more fully functioning than it might otherwise be. Solomon Northup and his 12 years as Platt teach us much about resilience. History and our coming to understand it teach us much about where we are and how we got here. And our reflections upon that uh, can teach us much about where we are going. But the concept of resilience throughout history, throughout our personal lives, that's a concept that, regardless of what tomorrow might bring, is one that lies at the, at the root of the ability of a human to overcome obstacles, to find a way in a future that is filled with challenge and uncertainty, and to hold true to who we know ourselves to be, as Platt did, knowing himself to be Solomon Northup, day in and day out, though he didn't speak of it. And so resilience is what comes out of this film, loud and clear and as a message to all of us. Thank you.